Maranatha greetings. Welcome back to our last session, last half hour of what to do to be prepared, how to get prepared. Uh, the first part of my lesson, the first 30 minutes, uh, describe what you are going to be preparing for, for what's coming. And if you have not uh, heard all my other six lessons, please go back and review them so that you can be fully knowledgeable of what the sign is and uh, what to expect. Now, I gave three examples of people at Y2K and uh, <clears throat> for those who take seriously um, and heed the words that I've shared with you over this, this series, um, you, you need to follow along with what I'm fixing to tell you. And uh, if you don't like the message, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just the messenger boy and uh, telling you what God's word says, like it or not. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 4 through 6, let me read them first and then let me back up a little bit. Uh, we're going to be honing in on and one, two or three of these uh, seven ones. There, there are seven things stated and each begins with the number one, uno. There's one body and one Spirit, capital S, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Okay. The one body, that word body has different meanings to different people today. I hear that word used uh, repeatedly uh, by preachers <clears throat> and uh, they mean it to represent all the believers in all the different denominations of the world. And in case you're not aware of how many denominations exist in the world today, uh, there for a while, I was misinformed. I thought there were about 3,000 or so denominations, rough numbers. <clears throat> Turns out there's about, there's over 10 times that many. There's over 30,000 different, quote, Christian denominations today. Let's let the Bible define the word body. Back up to Ephesians 1, the last two verses, 22 and 23, Paul writes, and he, that's the Father, will put all things in subjection under his, that would be Jesus' feet, and gave him, Jesus, as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now I'm going to skip to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17 and 18, and he is before all things, the he being Jesus, and he is also head of the body, the church. Drop down to verse 24, Paul says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church. Okay, so the word church and the word body are synonyms. They mean the same thing. The group of called out believers who were saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. They constitute the church. But let me be real clear with you. The Bible tells us plainly there is but 
one church that Jesus came to establish. It's his church. Okay, we clear on that? Good. Because in Matthew chapter, uh, I believe it's chapter 16, Jesus puts a question to the apostles. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Son of Man is a term in, in Jewish uh, terminology for the Messiah, found in the book. First and only place in the Bible is in Daniel, I believe it's chapter 7. <clears throat> yes, chapter 7. And they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, uh, Petros, a small rock, and upon this rock, the word in Greek is Petra, which means a huge boulder, the likes of Stone Mountain. I will build my church. Jesus was the establisher, the head, the builder of one singular, he didn't say church is, my church, singular. And on the day of Pentecost, we find that one church being birthed, being born. It's the saved people, the called out people. The word church, ecclesia, the Greek word means a called out assembly. It was not used in a religious way, shape, or form in the Greek. It's the called out assembly. Now, for 400 years, plus years, there was only one church of Christ in the world, the Lord's church. Christians who met in every city were part of the body of Christ. They were just in different localities. They all had the same head that they followed, authority. When, when Jesus, when the word says the head of, it means the authority of, the power where the power lies. In the Great Commission, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples because all power and authority lie in Jesus. Okay. Now, how does one become a part of this one church which is not a denomination. Actually, before I go there, uh, let me spend a few minutes talking about uh, a principle that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. There was something going on even in the first century while... Um, thank you. while the church was in its very formative years. First Corinthians chapter one. I'm gonna start in verse 10. Now I exhort you brethren by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all agree and there be no divisions among you but you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that are, there are quarrels among you. Now he explains himself. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, quote, I am of Paul, and quote, I am of Paulus, and quote, I of Cephas, Peter, and quote, I of Christ. 
Now, just, just to be clear now, Peter and Paul and Silas, Apollos rather, these men were not dividing the flock. Paul tells us that he figuratively, in chapter 4, he says, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes. So he figuratively applied their names to make a point. There were actually other men whom he did not name that were dividing and quarreling amongst the flock. Paul asked three rhetorical questions in the next verse, 13. And if you don't know what a rhetorical question is, it's a question that when it's asked in public, it's assumed everybody knows the answer. Here's a rhetorical question. Is the sky blue? Yeah, everybody knows that. Does a bear in the woods? Yeah, everybody knows where bears go. Okay, so that's a rhetorical question. So here they are. He says... Has Christ been divided? Well, the answer should be no. But sadly, that's not the case today. People were trying to divide Christ 2,000 years ago. Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Well, the answer is obviously no. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, they were not. They were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So, with these three questions, Paul is telling the Corinthian church, stop dividing yourselves. Stop listening to these men who are dividing the flock. Have nothing to do with them. Because in doing so, you're giving glory and honor to them as if they died for you. You're dividing Christ, his body. And before you know it, you'll be baptized in their name. And we're going to talk more about baptism, uh, which was the sixth one up there on the board. One baptism. Uh, we also have this admonition in Acts chapter 20. Get going in the right direction here. This is a very strong warning from the Apostle Paul uh, before he departs from uh, Ephesus. After t talking for some length to the elders <clears throat> that had gathered for this, this uh, parting instruction, in 2027, for I did not shrink <coughs> from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves, the eldership, the leaders, and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So the church, the body of Christ, the one church, the one body of Christ, the one Jesus said, I will build, the purchase price was his blood. Okay? Now, please understand, uh, I'm, I'm not being judgmental when I say this, but this is just the cold hard facts. Jesus had no concept of shedding even one drop of blood for a denomination, a man-made religious institution, by whatever name you wish to call it. There's over 30,000 different names out there today, all claiming to be part of the one body of Christ. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. 
They, there are people, he says, are going to be dividing the flock. From among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Every man-made denomination since about the 5th century when the first man-made denomination started in Rome, Italy, what we now call the Vatican, was started by a man or a group of men from within the clergy. Not from outside the believers, but from within inside the believers. Drawing away disciples after themselves and dividing the flock. Okay. So here we have the seed and the prophetic announcement that denominationalism was in the first century, as the church was just developing, was already at work. The work of lawlessness and division were already at work. Let me show you a, a, a little graphic example on the blackboard. We all know how fractions uh, work, and when we take one, one body, one body, okay, this number up top is called the numerator or the number. And the Bible tells us there's one, one church. This number is called what? The denominator. From which we get the word denomination. It's the one that divides. Well, here's the good news and here's the bad news. This is the one that Jesus is coming back for. This is not. About 500 years after Christ started his church on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the Catholic Church became entrenched within the Roman Empire, thanks to the uh, Roman Emperor uh, Constantine. Constantine. Thank you. Constantine. 500 years after Constantine, we have the beginning of a movement from within the Catholic Church, so from amongst your own selves, a bunch of clergy that said, we don't like all the changes that the Pope is making. We're going to start the Orthodox Church. We're going to accept all the existing rules and regulations uh, from the last 500 years, and we're not going to change any more Orthodoxy. So you have the uh, Church in Constantinople, the Greek Orthodox Church, it spread to uh, Russia, the Russian Orthodox, the Ethiopian Orthodox, and you name it. Okay, there's probably over a hundred different Orthodox churches. 500 years after that, it seems to go in cycles, we have Martin Luther that started the Protestant Reformation from within the Catholic Church. So, true to Paul's word, from amongst your own selves, men will arise. Dividing the flock, drawing away members. So we had the beginning of Protestantism and uh, the Lutherans were the forerunners of that. Since then, Lord knows how many Protestant denominations have come. Most, most of the 30 plus thousand are going to be Protestant. Okay, then uh, about 400 years after that, we have the modern-day Pentecostal movement that started in the early 1900s, 
out at Azusa Street in California. And uh, <clears throat> there have been all kinds of uh, small splinter groups come, you know, in the 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, you have the Seventh-day Adventists. You have the uh, Mormons in the early 1800s. Uh, history is just full of division. All of these denominations were started by men. Jesus, I'm sorry to tell you, did not shed one drop of blood for a denomination. And here's why. He said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. That divided house that's out there in the world today, when he comes back, he's, they're not going to stand. They're not going to be part of the catching up. If you're wanting to escape all the things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man, you have to be a member, part of, in addition to the one body of Christ, the one church. Now, Ephesians 4, if, if you can somehow tell me that two equals one, then we can draw different conclusions. But in my book, one means just that. One. So there's one body, which means there's one church. There's one spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, and he operates at the very front of this process called the Great Commission. When Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, when you speak the truth, and I'm telling you the truth today. Maybe it's the first time you've heard it. That there's only one church that Jesus shed his blood and died for. And it happens to be called, in other places, his bride. He's called the bridegroom, and the church is called the bride. Well, Jesus is not a polygamist, folks. He's not, he's not uh, got three or four thousand or thirty thousand different wives by different names. My wife, Marcia, when she married me, she took my name. And if you're part of that one body of Christ, you shouldn't be calling yourself some name that's not found. We're, they were called Christians first in Antioch. And by that name, the world will know us as Christians. Not as Catholics, not as Mormons, not as Jehovah's Witnesses, not as Shakers or Quakers or Mennonites or Amish or Nazarene, but as Christians. So there's one body and one spirit. The Holy Spirit operates when you preach the truth because he came to bring the truth. He will guide you into all the truth. And Jesus said, thy word is truth. When you bring the word, the pure word, unadulterated, untampered, Okay? Not a hybrid form of the word, but the true, pure word of God that leads you to the one Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, everybody's got the right man, but they're not all following the right plan. So the Spirit operates at the front and convicts and convinces people to put their hope in the one Lord, Jesus Christ. And he said, he that believeth, which is called one faith, the word faith and believe are synonyms, and has been baptized, there's one baptism, shall be saved, that person will get to see the one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. Somebody from the one church, I represent that one church, Christ's church. I don't represent a denomination. In fact, you cannot join his church. You can join any denomination you want. Go up and ask the preacher, preacher, how do I join your church? Oh, he'll, he'll beam, he'll smile and say, son, you come to the right place. Come here, let me tell you how to become part of his church. 
Okay? As I'm going to show you in a minute, you cannot join Christ's church. Called in one hope of your calling, that one hope, it's called the blessed hope in the Bible, is that there's redemption. There's going to be a catching up. There's going to be a resurrection day. And it's all based on the one Lord, Jesus Christ. And if you are part of the one faith, see there's 30,000 faiths out there today. And they all have their own bylaws and uh, guidelines. There's just been a big ruha up in the uh, Southern Baptist, I believe it's Southern Baptist Convention over sexual misconduct uh, that went, got shoved under the carpet and wasn't dealt with for decades and decades and decades. And now it's, it's finally uh, reared its ugly head and they're having to deal with it. Uh, and they have to go by their bylaws. Well, the Lord's church doesn't have any bylaws, okay? It has a way of dealing with it and it would have been dealt with back then. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Notice the one baptism is the one right before one God and Father of all is over all, in all, and through all. See, that one baptism is not optional, but the Protestant denominations for the last 500 years since Martin Luther have concluded that baptism is not a part of, it's not essential, it's not necessary for salvation. All you have to do is believe. Well, in the Great Commission, where I want to go next, we'll start with the earliest rendering, and that would be Mark, Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. This is after his death, burial, and resurrection, and that's very key and very important to this discussion. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. If you don't know what the gospel is, go look it up in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. That's it. See, you have to believe in Jesus and his atoning work. You have to be baptized, and then Jesus said, you're saved. And he that disbelieves is uh, condemned already. Simply disbelieving condemns you, but you have to believe and be baptized in order to be saved. And Matthew's account, in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now this is after his death, burial, and resurrection. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's how you make a disciple. You baptize them. Of course, they have to believe. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. So the teaching comes after they've become a disciple, a follower, student, of Jesus Christ. On the day of Pentecost, which is uh, the law, using the law of first mention, the first time salvation was preached, God's redemptive plan of, of grace was preached on the first Pentecost after the death of Christ. Starting verse 14, Peter taking the stand with them, raised his voice and declared, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, give heed to my words. He goes into a dialogue about who Jesus was, that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. He died, he was buried, he was raised on the third day, all according to prophecy. Many of the prophecies uh, were from King David. In verse 36, he concludes, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Now remember, 
It was just a matter of a week before Jesus gave the Great Commission. He that believeth and has been baptized shall be saved. Well, these people were not believing that Jesus was the Messiah. He didn't preach about sin anywhere in this dialogue, but simply that they did not believe Jesus to be the Messiah. Okay? And Peter said to them, repent, which simply means change your mind. About what? Well, the context is repent, change your mind about who Jesus is. Believe that he is the Messiah. This is not a repentance of sin issue. This is a repent, a change of mind of who Jesus is. Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit which uh, we're told in Romans 6, last verse, that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then verse 41, those who had received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls, added. In verse 47, King James, they were praising God, having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That's how you're made a part of the one church, the body of Christ. You believe in his atoning death, burial, and resurrection. You confess Christ so that the person teaching you knows that you believe. Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip. He opened his mouth and said, I believe. And then you are baptized, immersed in water for the remission of sin in the name of Jesus Christ. And then God washes your sins away with his blood and adds you to his one body, his one church. That's how you become a part of it. And on resurrection day, when the trumpet blows, the dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive and remain will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of eye and go after they go up. They go up first, we go up second, and that's the day of escape. Pray that you have strength to escape all the things about to come upon the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. I hope everybody in the sound of my voice is standing before the Son of Man and you follow God's plan. Follow the right man, follow his plan, and you'll be okay. You don't have to run to the mountains. God bless.